Hi everybody, my name is Alexander. Um, yeah, this can sound a bit scary, so I'm really surprised and very glad that we can s that I can see many people, especially after Andy's presentation, which would basically uh, he did not intend to scare people away, but <laughs> obviously he he did it, and that's not his fault. I can understand him. Um, let's see, building a framework with shared code on Android and iOS using React Native. Um, I would like to warn you, maybe, and again, scare away a bit. Uh, this is a bit an advanced topic on top of what Andy presented, because it deals with some problems that you may not be aware of if you have never uh, created a React Native application. Which brings me to a question how many of you have heard Andy's presentation and still want to create a React Native app? Please raise your hands. Yeah, okay, a bit under the 10. That's good. Um, how I uh, see this is basically, is it's just a pure engineering problem, uh, meaning that if we have some interesting piece of software that uh, does some stuff, uh, which can be basically created for multiple platforms at the same time that theoretically should save us some effort in implementation. And if it requires some some manual work to, to get it running, then why not? Let's try. We are engineers, right? Okay, determined. If you don't understand the some some of the um, some of the words or concepts, just try to try to remember that, and then just afterwards ask me anything. I'll try to explain as much if in, in the detail, but I'll have to be uh, I'll have to ask you to be focused because really a lot is going to be here. So again, why go React Native at all? I mean, why is everybody so obsessed with it? What are the advantages? Obvious ones, which are written in the readmes. Uh, what is our goal? Our, I mean, um, I mean my team. Um, hey, here's Andy. <laughs> um, what goal we set up for our team and what we wanted to achieve with that? Uh, different ways to integrate React Native. Unfortunately, there may be some overlap with what Andy already showed you, but again, it might be just a bit more advanced. Uh, well, I didn't know what he's going to be presenting, so sorry about that. Uh, when I personally would not recommend to even consider React Native as your alternative, uh, again, just some bad stuff and maybe not work aroundable. The obvious alternatives to the whole approach, like how could you architect the whole system the other way. Uh, just a bit of code and presentation, how it works internally. Again, trying to get the complex matter with an example. And yeah, I called it the good, the bad, the weird, just random observations about React Native and the ecosystem features so s that you understand. I'm coming from the native part. I mean, I'm a mobile developer on both Android and iOS platforms, and I did not know any JS before <laughs> actually starting with React Native. So that might be also a help for you because like, I. I I assume there are not many JS developers here, so maybe some tips and tricks. We have to agree on the naming convention. Whenever you hear framework, library, SDK, module, it's just the same thing. It's a standalone package of code, which can be integrated into some other piece of software. Because iOS treats it differently, framework, Android library, etc. Okay, a bit of a background. Um, I work in a team which creates native players. That means video player, which is capable of playing content, different kind of content, at a uh, tracking solution, uh, and all of this stuff is integrated then into multiple mobile apps that our uh, neighbor team is creating in within the same company. Uh, the same is done by the uh, web team on the uh, with the help of GS and React, I mean React GS. So 
at one point it was kind of obvious that we have three different code bases, three different CI, CD uh, environments, three different teams, projects, product owners, and so on and so forth. Let's try to combine that with a crazy idea to use a React Native. Um, we thought about our web player as a basis because obviously we have to have JS code um, running the shared code. So that means if our web player already has the set of the features like configuration, ad management, resources, tracking, whatever, the heavy lifting is already in the JS code. That means that we can try to leverage that and just create a wrapper or a native module bridge, whatever you call it, and yeah, have the native frameworks by by not creating three different code bases, rather having 1.5, let's say, code implementations. We also were lucky because our web player was already built with um, React Native in mind. That means that our uh, JavaScript team created multiple loosely coupled components. Uh, browser features were either extracted into the different modules or at least uh, it was not that difficult to extract them afterwards whenever we find, hey, you use browser feature and it doesn't work in React Native. And the actual UI was already written in React, which makes it at least portable to the React Native. Okay, let's see. This is our setup before we we have done anything. So a native iOS framework, a native Android framework, uh, which is directly integrated into the app. And yeah, it plays some video to simplify it. Uh, what happens when we add the JS and React Native environment? Well, this is going to be, this becomes our base code. And the, the frameworks are some kind of bridged into that. The two really, really different paths uh, that you can go or you will have to go if you create a framework. Uh, the first one is when your target app uses React Native already. That means you have to deal with some cross dependencies, the transitive ones. Uh, the second one is your target app does not use React Native, not aware of it, and is purely native. Let's see how it goes with the first one. Target app uses React Native. On the left, you see the iOS icon. On the right, the Android. So um, yeah, right now, it applies for both uh, platforms. The, the first option that Andy mentioned is just um, depend on React Native as an external dependency. Uh, basically, by you know build, gradle, compile, whatever version of React Native you want. Uh, again, Facebook does not provide the AARs for Android and some J Central. Well, they do, but the version is actually 0 0.20, which is like 15 months outdated. Uh, I think they, they are doing that for a reason. Um, they are waiting for the 1.0 version, and then it becomes available in the Central. Uh, you could do it the same way with the CocoaPods, just React Native version you need. and then you have a React Native environment um, with the help of which you can create a framework. Doesn't matter, actually, you can create an app then. The cave it, the really, really big cave it is you have to have the same React Native version in both app and library because, because React Native uh, team decided that they don't want, do not want to, to look through all the tickets uh, saying like, hey, it randomly crashed or it doesn't work. So that they force you to have the JavaScript and native implementation within the same version, which means if your app has one version of React Native and library the other one, nothing gonna work. Um, let's try another approach. So this is a obviously a challenge. We're trying to tackle every, uh, every angle of it. Let's try to reverse it and create not a native framework, but rather an NPM module. How many of you use NPM or know what it stands for? Okay, Node Package, yes, thank you, Vijay. Thank you. Um, Node Package Manager is basically a Gradle for Android and a CocoaPods for iOS. It's just a dependency manager where you can declaratively say, 
I want this module with this version and it automatically manages all the transitive dependencies, version conflicts, and so on and so forth. So since we are already in the realm of um, React Native and JS, we need a node package manager. It comes with a React. Uh, so that means that we can actually reverse the things and not integrate the native framework into the some kind of application, React Native or not, but we actually supply the node package or node module, which a user can then say, hey, package JSON, I want this stuff into my React Native project. Kind of understandable, right? Okay, good. Um, yeah. Okay, I had a, I had an image for that. So that was before the framework, the React depended on it, and we simply reverse it and say npm install instead of Gradle, uh, yeah, whatever Gradle update, Gradle dependencies. Um, the thing is, it works only when integrated directly into the React Native app. If uh, if we didn't have that bad luck, I wouldn't be telling you about this, but our setup is like we have another library in between. So that means our framework, as like a simple player with some configuration, is integrated into another library, which doesn't care about your React Native stuff, do whatever you want, and then it gets integrated into the React Native app. That sucks. Let's try to, let's try to hack it. What if we can package React Native into the library itself? making it a statically compiled dependency, dependency, forget it, make it a statically compiled binary, which is in your framework, the version you need, you don't care about the external environment, well, yeah, you have duplicated React Native environments. We'll see how it goes. So, the Android icon faded, that means we're talking about the iOS code. First, you start with renaming classes. Okay, let's skip back one more step. What we are trying to do is um, we're trying to abstract away from the dependencies of the app and make our library self-contained, meaning that we, our user, the user that integrates our library won't even have to care about uh, which dependencies our library has. Uh, the React Native is gonna be inside but the, um, we cannot just simply to have binaries with two same classes inside of an app because of class name collisions, right? Let's say Objective-C will tell you, no, sorry, you have class duplicates, RCT React root view, or RCT whatever. You have that in framework and you have that in app, and I will not tell you which one is used because this is undefined. And that's a bad thing, because if you have different versions, you have either crash or React Native version mismatch. The problem, right? Got it. Uh, no, because if your app is using the, uh, everybody heard the question? The try to swizzle it or dynamically choose uh, one uh, class name over another, right? It won't work because if the app relies on the greater version of React Native, it expects the class to have some public API, which has already changed, which will lead to a crash. So, um, we try to create our own React Native, let's say my favorite React Native, um, which is gonna be absolutely separate library, is gonna be integrated into our library, and then the user of the app can do whatever he wants, integrate any version of React Native, and there's gonna be no collision because the classes are different. That means you have to rename all the classes, which start with a class prefix inside the React Native you want. RCT root view should become something, three letter prefix root view. I warn you about choosing not three letter prefix because I tried and <laughs> there are some there is some there are a couple of places in React Native where they use hard coded hey let's uh, let's check the prefix well yeah if you don't have three letters the substring is going to be different and it's going to not just going to work so three letters uh, let's call it lib root view then you update all occurrences across all the source code of the React Native 
to use the new class names. The good news is that it's really simple. You can just create a regular expression, which would say uh, the beginning of the string, RCT, capital letters. God, they are all capital letters. Um, and replace them with your prefix. You can even try to put it into automated script. But I'll talk about that later. And profit. You get your own lib uh, my new react dot a, a y a. Who knows what the A stands for? Static library on iOS. That's correct. Um, to answer the question why there is no dynamic framework, uh, because React Native found some issues with running the JS core inside the dynamic framework, leaking memory, which they had not yet fixed. So it's static. So to work with Swift, you'll have to do some more magic, like module, uh, module maps, something like that. I don't remember, actually. That's it. You have the iOS. It works. Uh, basically, from now on, you can uh, publish, um, not publish, uh, you can just give your library to the user who will integrate it into the React Native stuff, uh, app, sorry, and they will notice nothing. The video played before it was native, the video plays now because, well, it works. Everything is self-contained. It doesn't have, um, there are no uh, collisions or overlaps in the React Native. Let's see how it goes within Android environment. Again, it's more complex, as always. God. First, you have to start. Well, we have name, uh, we have class packages on Java. So I, my initial thought would be that Objective C not having um, the namespaces would do me trouble, but it's actually vice versa. The class prefix is much easier to hack rather than the Java packages because, let's see. Uh, first, we have to rename all the Java packages from com.facebook, and then you see it's not only dot React into something like leap.facebook.react because uh, Facebook does not have everything under one package, com Facebook React. They have actually like 10 different packages, com.facebook. Uh, there is GNI and something else, and yeah, uh, com Facebook Statho, for example, uh, which is not even a part of React. It's just another public library of Facebook called Statho for the debugging. Uh, so you Basically, you cannot create a simple regular expression saying like, I want to change all the com.facebook to lib.facebook because you will inevitably replace other libraries and then you will have to change everything not only in the React Native, but also in all the dependent libraries. And that's a hell of a work. Then, if you manage to, you can try to update that uh, automatically in the IDE, like let's say Android Studio, Shift F6, uh, move package, it's going to hang and it's going to be stuck for five minutes maybe because there's a hell of a sources code base and well, it's not going to work. I mean, I didn't, uh, I had never mentioned it. Android Studio just hanged, so I had to restart and do it manually. Uh, then you have to update the Java imports. You renamed the packages in your React Native, now you want them in your framework and in all the dependencies like React Native module. Let's say vector icons. Oops, sorry. Oh, damn it. Um, again, the, to use the new package name. No questions? I mean, the train of thought is pretty clear. And then you have it. You also have C++ libraries, which are not part of the source code in Java unlike the iOS part. So you have to update the C++ libraries, and if you're wondering why I have the uh, namespace or package name in there, that's because there are many hard-coded paths to classes that had uh, from use, used from C++ to Java. Means l.com slash Facebook, blah, 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 rct root view, call this method on GNI. So you have to update all the com Facebook again not uh, touching the unrelated sources. And also you have to to change the class name prefixes because you updated the sources for iOS. That means it touched the shared C++ code. That means you have to do that as well. Then you have to publish the artifacts. 
and that's the thing about Gradle. You cannot just have a static library uh, like in iOS and then just you know push it to your React Native framework because Gradle would, will not like it. Meaning that um, you can try to use Jar Jar. Who knows what the Jar Jar is? Yeah, you tried it. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> exactly. So Jar Jar is a tool written by Google some 10 years ago, I think, uh, which basically mm, mangles with the internals of the jar file. Um, for example, you can um, you can rename the package name inside the already pre-compiled Java binary. Uh, unfortunately, you also have a C++ code with the hard-coded paths, so Jar Jar on the already pre-published React Native will not work at least not suffice not sufficient to, to, to just you know I tried it uh, so you have to publish an artifact uh, on the react native itself it's easy because they have a pre they have a gradle um, how do you call it a task yeah a gradle task uh, installed to maven local I think so you just invoke react native uh, colon install to Maven local, it builds everything, the C++ connects the dots, and boom, you have it in Maven local. Then you can just copy to, I don't know, Nixus Rape or whatever. Uh, and it will already have the new sources with Leap Facebook React. Unfortunately, that was my bad day. Really, really bad luck. I had some really weird runtime error in C++ somewhere. Uh, obviously, I will try that. I will give it another try, but I just should have enough sleep before they do that because it takes a lot of time. I Theoretically, I think it should work, meaning that I did something wrong and somewhere in the middle I failed. <laughs> but um, anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that another one more time and I'm, I'm going to post an update to my blog that you can then later check it out. Well, if this guy did it actually work. Um, the things that you have to know about this approach, it's obviously a hack, a huge hack. I mean, because it breaks the bonularity principle, because you have two absolutely same dependencies with when you build an app, you have to react native environments, and, and you just changed all the classes, uh, it doesn't feel right. Because the binary size increases with one more react native library, which is not one megabyte, you can or check how much is it I think about 10 megabytes the memory footprint when running the app will obviously increase by one open react native environment which is at least Java virtual machine or not a virtual machine but a JS core thing that actually executes your JS code uh, it's not that bad I mean I did some really really simple empirical testing uh, with running app with on iOS uh, it didn't change much I mean some maybe 10, 15 megabytes, but when you have 100 from the uh, start of iOS app doing nothing, well, um, you'll have to repeat that for every React Native module you have. So let's now, um, let's now, let me tell you what a React Native module is. Uh, this is a third-party node package module, uh, node module which has some native code, meaning that, for example, uh, you remember the approach B, publish an NPM module, which we tried? Uh, that this is it. So they have a React Native dependency. They say, oh, okay, I'm going to use the, uh, the features of React Native plus some native code. For example, uh, React Native video, React Native vector icons, whatever you find in the React Native dash, that's going to be a React Native module. And if you use a React Native module like React Native Vector Icons, you will have to what? You will have to change the class, uh, the Java imports, at least, and the prefixes for the classes for the iOS part, uh, because otherwise it would talk to the React Native in the application, which might not be the version that you are using, which means it's going to be a version mismatch and crash. Oh, yeah, okay, file system and many more. You'll have to do that on every NPM install because you are uh, doing stuff inside the, that 
uh, tremendously big node modules folder and uh, whenever you do npm install it just deletes everything and creates a new one uh, the same way as gradle clean for example works it just you know removes all the dependencies and downloads them from the beginning you have to do that on every react native update because you just messed with the internal implementation of react native they didn't want you to do so they changed public api or any internals and pff, just blew up in your face if you try to automate it to make a script to work around uh, problems four, five, and six, you may succeed, but it may also require changes on updates of React Native. So what do we do? What do we do? We wait for React Native version 1.0, meaning that we can then apply the approach A, which is just depend, uh, just just give it to the dependency manager to resolve your dependencies, and then you can go and say compile React Native version 1.0, and everybody's happy. Uh, the bad news, there is no roadmap for the React Native versions. That means nobody knows when the 1.0 version is going to be released, and how much backward compatible is that going to be. But let's not frown. <laughs> it's not that bad. We are trying to hack the things. Um, the second approach, just so that you know, the target app does not use React Native, uh, meaning that it's purely native. It doesn't want to deal with React Native environments with all that package JSON, npm install, what? Um, so for iOS, it goes like this. You simply embed the pre-compile or compile the React Native into static library, embed it as you usually do, embed framework, or rather, link link framework yeah something like that because it's not dynamic it's static and the whole source of the react native is going to be inside your framework that's it on android again just a bit more complex you have to publish the artifacts first the same react native colon install to maven local react native builds everything from scratch pushes it into your maven local folder um the bad news, again, you have to do that for React Native modules, the third-party dependencies. And these are uh, the creators of these modules do not care or rather don't want you to have native Android AAR archives because they think that you would do that from the NPM, NPM install, get the source code, compile everything together. So you'll have to basically create a Gradle task, install to Maven local, maybe sort of, I don't know, update a couple of things inside the uh, inside the module, and well, then it works. I, I did it for, uh, we have about five uh, external dependencies. It's just a matter of mm, creating one more, one time uh, build Gradle task, and then just copying to the other. So n it's, not, uh, it's not unrealistic. I didn't spend like months on this problem. <laughs> So it's not that bad. Then you add the dependencies as usual uh, in the ba build Gradle. You say, I want React Native, I want React Native vector icons, video, and so on and so forth. And build Gradle does everything you need to do. Okay. If you if you go away, if you walk away after what I give, what I yeah, present here, I, I'm not going to be blaming you because. I will not recommend, or rather, I think you will have hard times uh, working with React Native if your app is really, really native. Uh, for example, it's all about OS-specific APIs. You use, I don't know, got, well, I actually cannot imagine uh, the app like that because it's usually about the components, different, some of them may be really OS-specific, some not, but it's you know cameras, video playback, list views, items, maps. It's all it's all in React Native already. But anyway, if you have really really complex custom UI with like you never touch, for example, on Android, you don't you never go out of the view group or view. You dra draw everything on canvas. Some I don't know plotting whatever uh, can be there, and you don't use the default components at all you use some really complex mind-blowing gestures and animations everything on canvas in real time <laughs> uh, then probably mm, not gonna work because 
because you will basically have to implement that on Android and iOS, and there's going to be no shared code in the JS. So the the whole goal is just lost. Or your app is you don't have much to extract to shared layer at all. Like you can't think of the things that can be extracted to JS, then you will end up in two implementations either way. Just complicate your own life. If you uh, yeah, again, we don't probably know, don't have any JS developers here, uh, especially the ones that use multi-threading in JS. But if you happen to do, there are no web workers in React Native. Who knows what a web worker is? Never mind. Yeah, OK. No web workers yet. They're considering. Uh, alternatives, there are custom base, some really simple, but yeah, never mind. You don't want to overcomplicate the delivery pipeline the technical stack of your team and yourself, or simply your life. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, we're engineers. If you're really, really not ready for breaking changes on each minor release, which basically comes every month or so, yeah, but it's not that bad. As we have seen, OKHTTP OK, doesn't mind doing that. And that's uh, like an uh, Android library which millions of users rely on. Right, but they they just don't care about the problem. They they ship new API, and they think that if you need an old version, you just don't update. If you want new cool stuff, then you update, and that's it. Well, they obviously didn't think about the transitive dependencies, the packaging, the the triangle problem where it's not only be one library but multiple libraries involved. So bad for them, but. The really, really big question that our team and management and everybody uh, running around us saying, are you crazy, uh, we're asking ourselves is considering all the risks and complications and overtimes, <laughs> do we gain much more value uh, rather than developing all the clients separately? Is it really worth it? Um, we considered everything and we basically had an overwhelming yes. Wow, I'm super tight on schedule. Let's go really fast. Alternatives, the old school shared library in C++. Uh, you know, that's how that stuff goes. The new school, wait for the Kotlin native on iOS. A technical preview, no debugging, active development. The JetBrains is doing really, really good. Um, Swift on Android, it works, but uh, nothing of production ready, no roadmap. How it works? Uh, this is a Kotlin. It can be transpiled to Swift with some. I, I, I can regex, but basically. <laughs> so, mm, in order to integrate anything into the existing activity uh, in Android, that also overlaps with what Andy says. But we have to have a React root view, which would be called RCT root view on iOS. Um, so two instances: one for app, one for library. On Android, you also need a React Instance Manager, uh, not needed on iOS. So in our onCreate view did load method, you we just say, hey, I want to integrate a React view. And we say, we find, uh, on Android, we find a view by ID. This is going to be React root view. Uh, we say that our JS code is in the, the main module. The starting point is in the index.js file. Um, and we say that we start application, and boom, you have a React Native inside. Everything self-contained, nothing. Uh, it doesn't talk to native code yet, uh, but it, it works. The same way we want to integrate another view, we just find a lib React view, tell it to take the code from library.js, which can be alongside the main code or in cloud or whatever. Not actually, no. You have to have the main point inside the bundle uh, in the production, but then later I'll come to that. This is the point where we add the React Native modules like vector icons, whatever you want, maps. Uh, you just say that I want to use that package, and that's it. And we start an application, and we see a fancy player, which works. It basically has the shared JS code, which then resolves to a native uh, exo player or AV player video view. Um, if you're wondering, do I have to show the view 
in order to be able to execute the JS code? No, you can create the new view from scratch. Do not attach it to a uh, view hierarchy. And for example, do some job and then, you know, console log or whatever. Alrighty, the bullet points. You can update production JS code without app resubmit. The thing that Andy said, uh, great power, great responsibility. I w I don't mention about the responsibility. <laughs> I'm the technical perspective. You can, as we did, create a library loader, which is like a super, uh, super one class solution, which then loads uh, the actual uh, JS code, the bundle from the cloud, from the S3 cloud, for example. This way you can have configurations for different clients, like this client uses version 1.0, and this one required a fix, so we can use 1.1, and Code push, yeah, it it will not work at the moment because it has hard coded paths. So it means it nobody actually cares about what framework on React Native. No, an app, and that's why you'll have to just you know create a pull request to an open source committer. But it's it's possible. Live and hot reload JS code in debug. Um, let's not stick to it. It can be combined with Redux DevTools. Uh, who knows about Redux? That would uh, uh, these people will understand that it's very good because you have all that time machine stuff and debugging with the Redux dev, dev tools working in the React Native. Theoretically, if you have less code, that means that you must or at least should have fewer bugs. That means that if we had three code bases with all the sets of features duplicated, um, and if we just create at least shrink it twice to have a shared code and some native bridges. Uh, that should help. In a perfect world, I would uh, imagine that a JS team, uh, like the heavy lifters, heavy lifters do the features and maybe some major bug uh, fixes, and the native team just maintains the bridges, some native stuff like uh, the performance uh, performance critical native use or something. And React Native, uh, that's another comment to the um, question about the community, how big it is, how React Native is actually doing. My observation, it's doing very good because the community is huge. It's like a virus which is a bit destructive, but it's catching all over, you know, all over the world. Uh, the React Native, if you go to GitHub React Native uh, from the Facebook, you'll see that there are tens of thousand commits and I don't know hundreds of pull requests not all merged but you know Facebook has its own roadmap but it's getting more mature performant and consistent a lot of work being put into it the bad okay the interesting part you can write it down you have really really much more asynchronous code that you don't own you can actually fix some stuff inside the react native but you probably shouldn't be like uh, as James uh, on the first presentation said, you want to be a you want to use an utility of React Native. You don't want to actually do. Well, you might want, but probably you shouldn't at the beginning, at least. You previously you had only native. Now you have a native, a bridge, a JS. More places for subtle bugs. Um, not all modules from Node Package Manager will work out of the box. That means more to to the GS developers because like, hey, I had some pretty good library that I used in React GS, but it doesn't work in React Native. Well, that happens, usually because of browser features that are in these modules. Like, let's say example, React Native Firebase, the, you see the column web SDK, that means that somebody took the React, uh, sorry, Firebase.js and tried to run it on the React Native. Well, it just didn't work, probably because AdMob uses some browser related features but somebody created already, uh, again, the community. There's a version 3.1 of React Native Firebase, which wraps the native frameworks from Firebase, adds some more uh, features, and boom, you have it. Caching everything that you want. Not all features from React itself are supported, meaning that sometimes you face a thing like, ah, damn it, it's really, really uh, basic stuff like I cannot symlink a local module. Imagine you try to extract some shared code uh, in your own React Native module. You cannot symlink it to work it on it locally because React Native Bundler doesn't do good with symlinks. There are some hard link symlinks issues and it's not yet resolved. Many more little frustrations along the way. 
Rian is, uh, Rian, sorry, React Native is far from the version 1.0, as everybody mentioned, stable API. It will come. If you want to stick to it in future, you can definitely experiment now, and then when we have a stable API, all the really, really bad issues just going to drop. The weird part. If you didn't know that, you'll probably learn it the hard way, as I did. In debug mode, JS is executed not on the device with a JS core class, which, never mind, I don't have time. It's actually executed inside Chrome, like on your desktop, which means you can do some fancy stuff, like if you are in the development mode, you can uh, do the console group. That's a grouping that you have in a Chrome debugging tools. Uh, there is no such thing in the JS core. There is a console log, but no console group. So in, the uh, in the development, you can do some really cool stuff. Sometimes it has bad side effects. I mean, your render breaks because it runs not on the JS core, but inside the Chrome. It's really, really rare. And you have always, you have to always double check the performance with the release bundle. Because, because your desktop is much more powerful than even your iPhone X. So the bundle that is running on the device is going to be performing probably worse. But don't be afraid, not that, not that bad. React Native style sheets are not actual CSS. Again, for somebody, I'm coming from the native, native realm, so I, don't, I didn't know much about CSS, just the basics. And I had to relearn again because the style sheets are not actual CSS, but can be like a kind of transpiled with the help of style sheet create you use a style sheet create class to do them uh, there's also a thing called styled components I'm not a GS guy so maybe that's obvious but uh, the, the thing that um, helps you to manage the styling and it also works on react GS so you can like we also had a react web app and a react native you can have the shared styling with the styled components your technical stack will is going to be dramatically expanded. For somebody, that's a good thing. For somebody, that's going to be a bad thing. You don't only have to learn the JS or a be able to read it, but you also have to know the about how NPM works. Really, you'll have to, because you not only run NPM install, but some other stuff. The Babel also, preferably, because Babel is a trans... Uh, trans... Thank you. Transpiler that does some really cool stuff. TypeScript to J JS. The old JS to the new one, or rather, vice versa. Building C++ code, preferably if you want to mess with the things that, you, that I mentioned. Threading event handling model. It's just interesting. You don't have to dive deep at the beginning. The how React bridge works, it's really also... That was the most magical part for me before I uh, learned about it. Like, wow, I had a JS code and it runs on my mobile. How? Well, the fun part, you get more and more IDEs if you don't use the VS code, <laughs> like I don't yet. You have an app code, Xcode, WebStorm, Android Studio, Chrome, and everything running all together because you have to be able to debug through all the layers. I want to have a breakpoint in Chrome or React Native debugger tools. I want to have a breakpoint inside the Android Studio. And, you know context switching so I have to my mental stack also expands like linearly with all that stuff for our team uh, this journey definitely continues uh, progresses we we are not yet ready to release our framework to our company uh, like uh, friend team uh, but it's a parallel development and I'm gonna be well I hope I can um, I hope I can post the progress on that in my blog or maybe our company blog and yeah, let's see how it goes. It actually works. It So again, uh, it actually works for us. We can play a video uh, in the native without any performance impact. I mean, considerable like, oh, it's so slow, I cannot even use it. No, so even the, the, the complex thing as running DRM protected video, uh, with a whole lot of GS moduling, going here and there, bridging all the stuff, going to cloud, it works. For me, it's kind of a magic that, um, and I'm eager to you know to hack it even more. 
hopefully. Thank you. Hope that wasn't too too complex. Okay, questions. Yes. Uh, do we have a mic? Uh, hi. Uh, you mentioned about the migrating to from uh, native web to the React native app. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? You have already have uh, a React uh, native app, yeah, and you are trying to migrate in uh, your web part to this app, yeah. That's why the, the the main point you mentioned, yeah, you you created the library between it and so on. Uh -huh. uh, what about uh, the situ situation when you have hybrid app, another hybrid app? For instance, we are using uh, Cordova. And uh, we are thinking about uh, migrating to React, in, uh, React Native because of the performance, because of the all these pluses that you mentioned, and so on. Is it worse? Is it possible to, to do it? Uh, is it painful, for, for instance? So, OK, yeah, I think I understood the question. And I'll try to, uh, to answer it. I don't have any experience with Cordova, but what I know is that there is a web view which runs your JS code, right? Correct. Okay, then it means that you already have a good base, a good foundation for migrating to React Native because you have your JS code, which is, it might be browser features locked, but you can unlock the browser features into separate module uh, because React Native doesn't work with browser features. No DOM, no nothing. I don't know how Cordova works, sorry. So that means that you're half the way on porting Cordova to React Native, and you'll get all the advantages almost without disadvantages, because well, you already have a JS code, and it will run in the React Native, and you just need to create the bridges to the native modules, and you'll see the performance, at least performance. Uh, the problem is that uh, when you switch uh, Cordova to React Native, you're using new software, right? It doesn't matter. It uh, doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be React.js. React.js is... Uh, uh, is a framework for building UI mostly, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean the component stuff, the uh, s prop state, but the uh, React Native can run any uh, vanilla JS compatible code, which is any JS code out there. TypeScript can be transpiled to JS, or ES6 or any new ES can be transpiled to vanilla JS, and that will run on React Native, un unless you touch the browser features but it seems like you don't. So no dependency on React.js itself. It depends on it internally, but for the, for the view part, for the UI part. Does that answer the question? Good. Other questions? Yes. Thank you for a great presentation. It seems you have a lot of, a lot of knowledge, <laughs> I believe. And I'm wondering, uh, since you are still uh, in development yeah, mode right now, and uh, how many efforts did it take? Did it take? Okay. Uh, so, like in my position of mobile architect, whatever you call it, I basically I'm split between the teams Android, iOS, and GS, and trying to to fit all the pieces of puzzle together so that we have some uh, one code base and everything works. Uh, so like I'm on the top trying to figure out the, the you know the down parts. Uh, the actual amount of efforts, we have incremental proof of concepts. That means that we first uh, we first agreed with management that we take some, I don't know, maybe a week to see if React Native actually works for us. I mean in our setup or something. Really simple thing. Okay, it worked. Then we worked on some other things. Then we came back to proof of concept number two. Can we actually play a video? inside the uh, React Native, check. Again, again, proof of concept number three, can we package a framework out of it without video? Check. Another proof of concept, so we're incrementally moving uh, towards the our like big goal, and if we would fail on any step, then probably we would abandon this idea. But we did not fail, and hence this presentation. So it's, it's hard to estimate the uh, efforts, but um, it's not month of work. I mean, I was mainly uh, doing that by myself. I also had a couple of colleagues help me on iOS side, but it's, 
I don't know, if you have an R&D uh, department in your company, then it's something that they can do really easily because I had to interchange between the uh, maintenance of the old project and switching to the you know, new cool stuff. So doable, totally doable. We are still in the proof of concept mode, meaning that we don't have beta or public API or something. We are still uh, trying to, again, fit the puzzles, fit the pieces of puzzle together. But this is what my uh, observations and outcomes are. So I hope that will that will help you not do the same mistakes or maybe you know just push the wall a bit further. With uh, what kind of benefits you can see right now? Probably, uh, probably uh, you would like to go with another. Okay, so t in order to recap, the much more value that we are seeing is uh, three code bases is um, is expensive. It's three teams. It's uh, more people, it's more maintenance, it's the same set of features, it's more product owner's efforts uh, to begin with because you have to, you know, have to three separate tracks. If you have one, mm, it doesn't matter one code base, if you have one product which, is, which shares the most of code, then you basically, you can de deliver quicker. You can update code in the production. The Apple uh, Christmas, release or Christmas submits are notorious for huge lines and you don't have to do that. That's a, that's a big benefit for us. Um, the other key point is that in our team we were uh, willing to get new knowledge about the GS. It, it wasn't a drawback, it was an advantage to us that we could expand our technical stack and well if it would fail then yeah we at least learned something. So does that answer the question? Kind of. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, if you want, you can update. Uh, follow me on Medium. There, it's kind of empty right now, but you know the post will follow. I I had to to create the slides before. Thanks. <laughs>